In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about region tags and then some control structures, how to design out your code, and just kind of some basic concepts that we need to cover. I get that today's lecture is going to be probably redundant with your previous classes because we're going to be talking about things like if statements, while statements, for statements, things like that where we just kind of have to dive in and just learn the syntax. We have to learn this up front before we can really start solving the more complex problems later on. So the first thing I want to talk about is what are called region tags. And region tags are just used so that you can organize your code better. So if you just type a pound, and you can kind of see the different options that will come up. We're going to type region and then pound pound. And that will pop in a region for me. Now a typical region tag that I like to create is something called attributes. And I put all my class level variables in here. You know, so private int i, whatever it is, you know. The reason that you do this is you'll notice that I can now collapse down my code or open it back up. And in most programs, you're going to have a lot more than one variable. You could have 5, 10, 100. And so it's just nice to be able to close this down. The other region tag that I have quite often is methods. So I'll come in here and do methods. And then I'll make sure that all of my methods are inside this region tag. And you can also have region tags within region tags. And I do this quite often also. So if I have a class, you know, let's say these, this, this region is for all the methods that you know, have complex math in them or something like that. And so I'll have regions within regions so that you know, as you collapse down the code, you can open up just those regions that you're interested in. And if you do this, it just makes your code so much more readable and accessible. Just imagine, again, someone 10 years from now jumping into your code and having to get their head wrapped around it. So how you organize it is so vitally important to that person, or which even could be you, you know, five years. This happens to me all the time where I have to go back and view my old code, and it's like someone else wrote it. So how you organize it with these region tags or, or in general is just very critical to be a program being maintainable. So with that, now let's talk about designing out our code or creating pseudocode. Now the reason I want to talk about this is because a mistake that I find a lot of students make and a lot of engineers make is that as soon as you kind of have your head wrapped around the problem, you jump into it and you just start typing away at the keyboard. You just try to solve the problem without thinking it through. And it's just so obvious to me as a professor who have students, you know, turning in the same type of assignments over and over again, which students sort of paused before they did their assignments and planned it out versus those students that just jumped in, dragged some buttons, double clicked it, wrote some code, wrote some more code, had to go back, fix this code because it didn't work with this code. So I promise you, if you just spend a few minutes up front, it will save you hours later on with fixing code and rewriting code. So what does that really mean? Why are designs so important? Well, in the real world, you're going to be solving problems that are a lot more complex than the assignments in this class. You're going to... these these problems that you're solving, they could take years just to get your head wrapped around them. I know that sounds just outlandish, but I've done this several times over my career, where a program, I spent two to three years just designing out my program, getting my head you know, wrapped around the architecture that I want, how my code's going to call other people's code, and how we're going to interface, and all these things, just so that when we actually got to the point of writing code, it's all going to fit together and you're going to do this part and this person's going to do this part and, and how we interface has already been defined so I can do mine, they can do their, theirs and we can bring it together in the end. So for in this class what I highly recommend is you sit down, you understand the requirements and then plan it out. Plan out here's my classes, here's my methods, here's how I'm going to validate and then go into the code. It'll make a world of difference I promise. So with that let's go and just learn some of the basic concepts now. For instance an if statement. I think everyone's probably done an if statement, but if I type if tab tab, you can see it's going to actually put in that syntax for me. And again, I apologize, I know it's sort of something you've probably already seen, but let's, let's just kind of look at the syntax, you know, so b is you know, my variable, let's make it false. So now down here, we could say something like b is my var equals true you know, then we would do this code. Now in this particular instance, we can see as we're coming through here, you know, this is obviously going to be false, so we could have an else statement that we actually wanted our code to run. So we're saying, if this is true, execute this code, otherwise execute this code. And that's how we would do that in C-sharp. Now the next 
concept we want to go over is a while loop. And so we're going to take a look at figure 5.9 from the book. And as you go through here, we can see we've got some variables that we're starting off. It's just a basic console program. And what they were trying to do is the goal, you know, what the problem they were trying to solve is, is we need the user to enter 10 grades. So that's what the while statement is good for here, where we're just going to continually loop until we have 10 grades. So the while statement works a lot like an if statement. So you have to this variable or the, this condition, sorry, as long as it's true, we will continue to execute what's inside the loop here. So in this case, you can see if I highlight grade counter, it's going to start off with one. So is one less than 10? Yes. Therefore, come in here and get another grade from the user. And the important part is that this last statement right here where grade counter is being incremented by one. So the second time through, grade counter is going to be equal to two. Two is still less than 10, and then three, it's going to go all the way up until 11, which that statement is false, where it's going to skip over this, and then come down here. Now we're going to try to print out the average of those scores. So we have 10 of them, so we total up all of the scores. So in here, we were keeping track of the total, and now we're going to divide that by 10. But this is something that you need to be aware of, of something called integer division. So what's happening here is that because this is an integer, we notice that this is of type integer, and then I'm putting an actual integer in here. If you divide an integer by an integer, you'll get the integer result. You're not going to get, you know, 37.8 or 67.7. You're not going to get a double. Even if this was a double over here, you're not going to get it because this is going to have integer division. You're going to get an integer, but then store that integer into a double. So I see this a lot on these early assignments from students where they'll actually they have trouble maybe calculating an average on you know some of our assignments or their statistics and therefore it's integer division that's the problem. So what's the proper way to do this? There's a couple ways to do it. Let's take a look at another program, uh, Figure 511, and we come in here. It's very similar to the, to the one we just saw, where we're going to come in, we're going to have a console, we're going to say, hey user, give us a, a a grade or a negative one to quit. Same kind of concept, but this allows us just to go for as long as the user doesn't enter a negative one. We're going to continually keep adding up the total, and we're going to print out this grade. Or sorry, keep track of the well, keep track of the grade. Now we come down here as long as it's not negative one. So now here's how we're actually going to count or, or calculate the average. Now I want to point this out. So a total up here at the top. So total is, it's one, two, three, four, you know, it's however many grades. It's just an integer. The grade counter, they're also just, sorry, that, oh, sorry, I got that backwards. So total was adding up the grades. But you'll notice that we're actually expecting integer grades in. So I apologize, I had that backwards. Where the, the total is, you know, they've entered in 26. They've entered in 86. And if we're adding, we're adding up integer values, you know, a grade is not 57.3. But an average could be. So we're dividing two integers together. So there's a couple ways now we have we can cast our variable so that we can actually get a decimal or a double value like we want. One way we can do that is use this cast syntax. So what we're saying is that okay, we know that this one's a double, and we don't want or sorry, this one's an integer, and we don't want an integer divided by an integer. So this casts this integer up to a double. So we're explicitly casting this integer up to a double. So now on this side, we have a double divided by an integer. So we'll actually get that double division. It's not integer division anymore. And so we'll actually have a decimal place when we output it here. There, you can also do implicit cast in C sharp. So if you were just doing something like assigning, a assigning an integer into a double, it'll implicitly cast that for you because there's no way of losing any, any data. But it's not true if you're going from a double into an integer. So that's why, in this particular case, you have to cast this in order to do the, this type of calculation. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next figure, 5.15. And in this one, we're just going to kind of take a look, look at some syntax for increment and decrement operator. Uh, again, I think for other languages, you're, you'll have already seen this, but it's good to at least see the syntax. So here, we're just going to print out the value of c, which you can see c equals 5. Here, it's going to print out 5 and then increment the value because it's post-incrementing. And then we're going to print this out, and it would display 6. Down here, we're going to reassign c equals 5, so that prints out 5. 
But now we're going to pre-increment before we print this out. And then the next one will just display six. My personal opinion is just don't do this. Like this is just confusing to put these right within the statements to anyone debugging it, including probably yourself. And this is exactly how bugs are introduced. So I would always do these on a separate line where you would assign the value to C or increment the value of C and then print out the value of C. I would not increment or decrement within a print statement or any other statement like this. It, it just kind of confuses things. Next, I'm going to take a look at an example program that I've created. We have an, our example programs, this chapter 5 and 6. And we're just going to kind of review some of the things that we learned today. And so we've got this Windows, it's just kind of a very, very basic. And we're just going to kind of go over the first parts here for our, for our control structures. And so we've got this button. So when we click it, we're going to come in here and we're going to get the value out of our text box. Now, I did this on purpose because I wanted to show you hey if I enter an invalid value here so if I run the program and it pops up and I enter in something like the letter A to the text box and then I click this you can see that it tries to cast this letter so you can see the letter A and I'm trying to cast it into an int 32 so a better way to do this would have been to take this use the int 32.try parse and if it was invalid, then just display you know a label that says error, you know invalid input, and then not continue executing the rest of the code. So again, this is something you always want to be careful about. You never should trust user input. People fat finger things or purposefully try to break your program. Next, we're just going to say you know if the number is greater than five, print this out. Else, if the number is greater than this, else this. So just trying to show you some basic if else if stat you know uh, syntax. For how to you know start solving those basic problems that we have down here here's another example of a while loop and so we're just going to create our variable have our while loop here and we're just going to continue to print out the data and we're going to print it out on a new line and then we're going to increment it and just keep going around so again it's just a very very simple while statement just to show you how to continue to go through the loop solve some kind of problem inside of it continue to increment this and then down here, these are just the different ways that you could increment or decrement. And, and these are all valid on one line. So you don't have to actually, it'll assign it for you just by doing a statement like this. So I think the best thing to do is just write some very simple programs and kind of jump in for yourself and do some ifs, do some whiles, and it'll just kind of cement those syntax of C-sharp into your mind. Thank you.